So, to bring some life to those words, I would like to introduce right now our sister, co-chair of the interim phase, as we all are, because in two years' time we could all go, and that would be fine, because you have elected someone else to stand here, and that's good, because you need to engage in the process. We will still be here. We don't have to be in the leadership. We're committed to the parliament. Yeah? We don't have to be in the leadership. We're committed to the parliament. So two years from now, we're, we're one year of three years in an interim period right now. So we have two more years to go before we're fully constituted. And then you decide who is going to be the one steering the ship towards liberation. Okay? That's the plan. So to give life and meaning, more life and more meaning to the interim National African People's Journey. Our theme for this year of the Black People's Day of Action is the rebirth of a nation. And Sister Ekua, as one of our co-chairs, is going to speak to that theme. So please, brothers and sisters, put your hands together, your foot, make some African noise for our Sister Ekua Stanford. <laughs> Greetings. <laughs> How's everyone doing? Okay. All right, I'm gonna, I have a very, can you hear me? All right. I have a very, very difficult task. And I am extremely nervous because I always worry that I'm not going to do justice to what it is I've been asked to do. So I'm just saying that very openly and honestly at the beginning because I have a huge task in trying to really get across in the limited time that I have really what we're all about. The journey that we have taken, where we're at now, but what it is is our projection in terms of the future. Yeah. And I know that some of you in the room are familiar, have been to many of our meetings before, and so we'll have more awareness, knowledge, and understanding than others. So I also have the task of trying to speak in a way that everybody can understand. So that's why I'm nervous, because I'm not sure that I will succeed. But I will do my best. Just to say a little bit in terms of my portfolio, we have within the National African People's Parliament, I'm not sure if everyone's familiar, but the concept of the National African People's Parliament is a nationwide, independent, representative body whose purpose is to promote, preserve, and protect the best interests of African people domiciled here in the United Kingdom. And of course, by African, we mean people who self-define as African, black people, people of African descent or African Caribbean or Caribbean or whatever, whatever, yeah? And so we have some key objectives. And this, as I said, might be a refresher for many of you, but for some of you, it, you might not be aware. And that is to be an effective, constituted, and mandated voice for Africans in the UK to define, defend, and develop the best interests of Africans in the UK through self-affirmation and institution building as well as campaigning and lobbying around key issues of concern and interest to the collective survival and development of African peoples. It's also to mobilize all African peoples who want to be a part of this parliament to play an active and progressive role. We are seeking to therefore build and forge a principled unity across social, organizational, ideological, and religious lines towards the aim of our collective community empowerment and also to build the capacity of ourselves as a people so that we can actually 
you know, be about promoting a higher quality of life than what we currently enjoy. We're also seeking to be a body which will investigate the causes and implement solutions to many of the injustices, the disadvantages, and the maladies that disproportionately affect us as African peoples, especially our young people, and to develop constructive engagements within this society and overseas, internationally, to build and raise the profile of our presence, not only today, but in terms of who we have been historically, who we are today, but who it is that we are still in the process of becoming. And to also progress the aims and the objectives of the National African People's Parliament. And we want to ensure that we leave a legacy. We have too many examples of organizations starting and folding. We want to leave a legacy. So we are very much concerned with succession planning in terms of our young people, our youth, so that they can hopefully carry on some of the works, not that we have started, because we ourselves are carrying on a baton that has been passed to us. And we operate according to we have an interim national organizing committee, and that is a body that is uh, made up of various organizations, movements, and individuals who really are seeking to be part of shaping and preserving and protecting the best interests of African people. Now, this interim national organizing committee is uh, across the UK at present and we are seeking to extend that. We also have subcommittees of which we've heard some information about. We have finance and fundraising, legal and constitutional, admin and communications, media and publicity. We also have our youth core, which we've, al we've already heard from our youth core today. So these are the various ways in which you can engage and get involved with this parliamentary building process. And we invite you to sign up to a subcommittee, to express an interest in the governing structure of the Interim National African People's Parliament, which is called the INOC, the Interim National Organizing Committee. We have taken it this far but in order even for us to fulfill our objectives, we are going to need your support and we are going to need your active involvement. So some of you may have just come today and wondering what it is that we're going on about, what, it, why it is, what is it we're talking about. And if you have suggestions, constructive suggestions, as to what it is that we can do to improve our organizing efforts this far, then we would invite you to let us know those, but not just tell us, well, you should do this and you should do that. We invite you to be a part of this process. And we've heard from a report from our media and publicity subcommittee on the importance of our website and you know not because it's a website but because it is a public interface with the work that we are trying to do by way of organizing please do sign up to the newsletter so that we can keep your uh, contacts and you can also visit the website to be updated and informed as to what it is that we are doing now, one of the key things that comes, I'm now coming on, that was just the introduction, but I'm now coming on to talk about the theme. You all will remember seeing the publicity for today. And there's it, actually, there's been some <laughs> interesting commentaries around this, this image. But we have a woman here, and she's pregnant, obviously. And in her belly, are our people and so we have chosen the theme the rebirth of a nation and I'm going to speak I am going to come on to speak to that theme but before I do that I just want to say a big thank you and I want to say a big thank you to everybody who has been involved with the process thus far every single person 
I'm not just talking about subcommittees and leadership of subcommittees and our, you know, leadership of the Interim National Organising Committee. I mean everybody, those that have been involved, even those that are no longer involved. And I say a big thank you to many of you who will become involved, but you just don't know it yet. And I say that because it's not an easy task trying to do what we are doing. And this is where I have to share, and I love this quote and I always use it, um, from Amikal Cabral. And he was a freedom fighter, he was also an agricultural engineer or an agronomist in terms of the liberation struggle, struggle in Guinea-Bissau and Cape Verde. And he told us that we should hide nothing from the masses of our people. That we should tell no lies, that we should expose lies whenever they are told. Mask no difficulties, mistakes, failures, and that we should claim no easy victories. So I'm using that quote to say, yes, there have been mistakes. Yes, there have been wrong turns. Yes, we could say we've even had failures. But that's part of the process of getting to where we are today. And the challenge that we have is can you still be on board despite your critiques, despite what you think should be done and other people should be doing it better? Can you stay with us? Have you got the patience and the tenacity to be able to stay with a process, to be able to fall out sometimes, yeah. but we come back together. Yeah. Or, or are you one of the naysayers? Are you one of the naysayers who is saying, well, what are they doing? This is not going to succeed. Are you one of those closet armchair revolutionaries? Are you one of those who, even though you're in the camp, are not of the camp? And I'm saying this in all humility. I'm not saying it to insult anybody, because that's a question that we only, each and every one of us, can genuinely and truthfully answer. But that's why I wanted to say thank you, because I wanted to say thank you to everyone, including the naysayers. Because it is through your opposition and I'm not speaking to the people in this room, I'm speaking to our people wherever we are. It is through that struggle that we are going to succeed. And we are going to sharpen what it is that we are doing. And we are going to ensure that we do not fail. So we thank you. But more than that, what we need is your strength and we need your commitment and we need your courage to in order us to keep doing what it is that we are trying to do. What we are trying to do is truly historic. And it's historic because for a long time, I'm not saying there's been other efforts to get us to this point. There has been an African United Action Front. There has been a Black United Front Parliament. But there's been Global African Congress. But this is the National African People's Parliament. And this really has evolved from all of those organizing experiences. Because we recognize that we need to come together. Yeah. We can no longer allow disunity in our community to govern the way in which we conduct our affairs. Yeah. This is about our collective survival, our collective security, as well as our human prosperity and flourishing as African peoples and as human beings. But the theme of rebirth of a nation talks about a very specific thing. And it talks about being a nation. Now, most of us in this room, I would like to think, recognize that we are African people. But what we're seeking to do through this institutional vehicle and framework, which is not the end, 
It is simply a means to an end. And what is that end? That end is to be part of building a nation. Okay? So we have to go from recognizing that we are people with an ethnic label, an ethnic identity, to looking at how people collectively come together and form themselves into a nation. What is a nation? A nation may refer to a community of people who share a common language, culture, ethnicity, descent, or history. In this sense, a nation has no physical borders. However, it can also refer to a people who share a common territory and government. Nationalism, which is defined by Merriam-Webster's dictionary as loyalty and devotion to a nation, especially a sense of national consciousness exalting one nation above all others and placing primary emphasis on promotion of its culture and interests. So when we talk about rebirth of a nation, we are talking about rebirth into an African nation. Let me make that point very clearly. This is not about assimilation into Britain and the British nation state. So if that's what you're interested in, then I'm sorry you're in the wrong place. So even though we are inclusive in that we are throwing out the net wide to try and embrace as many of our people as possible, from our organizing thus far, we know that not everyone is going to get on board this. And that's okay. Because where we're at, people, is you have to decide. You are going to have to decide who you are going to serve. Are you going to serve your people and your nation, which is forming? Or are you going to be used to serve the interests of a nation that is still committing genocide against us? I know some of you may be thinking, yeah, but what does that mean? You know, some of us get so caught up with this passport the British passport, but let us remember why it is we're here and how we have come to be here. So as I said, this is about choosing and the nation that is being reborn, rebirthed, is a nation that has never existed before. Now let me clarify that because Africa today exists as a geographical landmass. But the Africa that exists today, is it a Africa of the Africans or is it a European Africa, a Euro Africa, as Kwame Nkrumah, as Sajifo Dr. Kwame Nkrumah told us, or is it a Pan Africa? Is it a Portuguese Africa? Is it a French Africa? And we can just look at the languages that we speak in Africa to get a sense of what kind of Africa it is today. The borders that exist today, are they our borders? Do they define our realities, our nation grouping? So that's why I'm saying the rebirth is into a nation that does not exist as present. Because the Africa that we are going to be reborn in to and that we are connecting to is not the Africa that exists today. Let us be clear about that. It's not the Africa that we say, oh, I'm a Nigerian, I'm a Ghanaian, I'm a South African, I'm Sudanese. It's about recognizing what was the indigenous borders of that land. Who are the indigenous peoples? So let us not think that we have a free Africa, because we don't. And one of the things that we have to do is we have to regain our historical consciousness. And we have to tie 
our efforts here in Britain in terms of our organizing and our anti-racist struggle back into the struggle against imperialism and colonialism as it still is happening on the continent of Africa today. What is the DRC about? The war in the Congo. What is the war in Mali about? What was Libya about? What is it about? But yet we say we're free. So if we're saying we just want to be here in a cocoon and think that we don't have any connection to what's going on in our motherland and that we're here just because we wanted to take a holiday or that we just love England so much, then we are mistaken. We are here for historical reasons. It's no accident that we are here. Now recently, the University College London released this research. It's a database, an encyclopedia of so-called British slave owners who received 20 million pounds in compensation in, in, the, in those times in, on so-called abolition, 1833, which was 1838, moving into emancipation. And they've managed to map where all this money went across British society. So if we want to see ourselves as just being British, then by all means. But the National African People's Parliament is about us developing our African identity and building that identity around our power base, which is our people who are not just in Africa, they're in the Caribbean, they're in other parts of the Americas, they're in Europe, they're in Australasia, they're everywhere. And that is the nation that is being rebirthed. Right. And it's being rebirthed because even though it hasn't happened like that before, where we see ourselves as one people globally, even though it hasn't been articulated in that way before, it's a rebirth because the remnants of the old, which our ancestors carried with them, which they gave up their lives for, so that we could be here, they sacrificed so that we could have a better life. But the better life was not now to get in bed with our oppressors and think this is progress. That's not what they fought for, brothers and sisters. The better life wasn't so that we could be seen to be the leader of the House of Lords. Let us recognize what these institutions are. Let us recognize who we are. And that's why I said you have to make a choice. Now, strategically, obviously, we're here. But Jewish people are here. It doesn't stop them defending the interests of Israel. Asian people are here. It doesn't stop them linking back to Asia. All other peoples are here. And it doesn't affect their ability to live in this country but recognize where their allegiances lie. So why is it so hard for us? Why? What has happened to us? Why is it we no longer feel that we have a responsibility to reconnect with our people globally? Why is it we feel that we can just act in Britain and think that we're going to get power in Britain? Don't you know that real power is international? We have to look at our power base as being where our people are. And so that's what we're seeking to do. Why? Because we're tired. We're tired of all the death. We're tired of all the discrimination. We're tired of all the broken promises. We're tired now that our children, many of them, don't see any future. We're tired of that. And we're tired of pleading and begging with our former slave masters and colonial masters to do for us what only we can do for ourselves. The question is, are you ready for this? Are you ready for this? Because this is going to take work, collective responsibility, 
because this is what we have been born to do. So the rebirth of a nation. We have this nation that every generation of many of those, I mean, February is so-called Black History Month in the USA and across the Caribbean and so forth. And we love to call upon the names of the greats in our communities. We love to do it. But how many of us are willing to follow their example today? We love to study history, but how many of us are learning the lessons of history? How many of us are even courageous enough to do what some of those did before? How many of us, if we had a modern day, let's just say Malcolm X, Amy Jakes Garvey, Honorable Marcus Mosiah, if we had a modern day, how many of us would even work with them? How many of us? Because we have people like that today in our communities. But they're not the ones who get on these little lists of who's the most powerful black people in Britain and who is the most successful. They always throw up these models of people who are successful in their establishment and tell us that is progress. And try and falsify our history and our contributions. So we have to do some assessments, brothers and sisters, of where we are at. Why, despite this rich legacy, have we not even honored 10% of what many of those freedom fighters in the last 100 years, I'm not even going back to the beginning of our history, even the last 100 years, why have we not been able to fulfill some of the blueprints, the black prints, the African prints that have been laid out for us? Why have we become so docile and complicit in our own enslavement today? Why are we so complicit in the continued despoilation of Africa? Because guess what? If we think we are going to get prosperity in Britain, not recognizing the role that the British state is playing today, the imperialist role, we love to talk about America. We love to talk about what America is doing, this um, empire, but we don't see what Britain is doing, and we're here. Many of us born here. Many of us have no plan to be anywhere else. So why can't we see that, brothers and sisters? Why can't we see what our responsibility is? And that's why we have to build this parliament. That's why. Because we have to counter the tide we have to counter the tide of the weight that is against us. The seductiveness of actually being complicit. It's seductive. People talk about how can we make organizing and being African cool. I don't want to be cool. We spent enough time being cool, okay? We spent enough time joking and jiving and, what, and acting the fool. It's not that time anymore, brothers and sisters. Okay, it's not that time. And we have to, in the spirit of love, be able to pull one another up and recognize that where we are today is the shortest moment in our history. The only way we can determine who we really are is we have to look at ourselves in history and culturally. And that will give us an indication as to whether we are really progressing or whether we are regressing. Okay? So we're about a rebirth of the nation. And it's very simple. We need a vehicle, a platform a group, a lobby group, an interest group. It's a parliament, a representative body that will shape policy, but seeks to govern ourselves. And it's based on the pillars, which are the organizations and the interest groups and the movements that are forming and coming together under this united front of a national African people's parliament. But the purpose and function of doing this is not just to replicate the Muslim Council of Britain, the Hindu, Hindu Council of Britain, 
the Jewish Board of Deputies. It's not just to say, well, they've got theirs and we need to get ours. The purpose is around what we call national liberation. Okay? This isn't about no BME thing. This isn't about more African MPs in Parliament, Westminster Parliament. That's not what this is about. It's not what it's about. There's enough of that. And if that's what you want, do that. But what we are saying is that even those of you who seek that as your level of progress and success, are you prepared to be a part of your nation? Don't forget who you are. Yeah. Don't forget the sacrifices of your parents and your foreparents who wanted much more for us than what we are now accepting for ourselves. And we have to look at this not just in terms of who we are today, but there's a principle called intergenerational justice. And what that means is that let us ensure that we are not going to sell out our foreparents because we want quick gains today. And let us ensure that we can guarantee a future even for those who have not yet been born. The indigenous peoples of the Americas talk about the seventh generation principle. And what that means is that whatever policy, whatever, uh, I don't know, whatever compromises, whatever it is that we think we, we want to aim for, we have to look at it in terms of seven generations down the line. What will it mean for our people? We have to go beyond short-termist thinking and we have to move towards long-term thinking. Okay, because this is what our ancestors knew. They knew that they wouldn't have been able to fulfill even some of their visions and aspirations in their time. But that's why we're here. Because their work is unfinished. And that means we have to carry on their work and their labor. And it's not just about calling ourselves African either. And it's not just about dressing African. It's a lot more than that. Those are the surface things. But it's about us really unlearning the Eurocentricity and the Euro literacy and the Euro sensitivity that we have. And it is about us becoming African literate, Afri literate, Afri sensitive. That's what it's about. This is a reformation of who we are. Everything that we have come to be, everything that we accept as true, we have to do a reassessment of that. Now, the other thing that I want to point out is in the legal and constitutional subcommittee, we have been looking at these issues because many of us, including myself, studied law within this system and they tell us all these fancy terms and there's something called constitutional law. But as you know, this country, the United Kingdom, in terms of even their governance system they have today, it took, what, over a thousand years to get to this point? And we've started this process, what, from 2011? So we are not even quite two years into a process. But this country has a constitution, but it's unwritten, an unwritten constitution. Yeah. And then many of us who've been uh, trained in this system think we know law. But the constitutional law is a Eurocentric constitutional law. And in the parliament, we have a subcommittee that looks at constitutional law not only in terms of the Eurocentric, because we have to learn many different systems, but let us not get caught up in that. We're doing our own constitutional law, and we're in the process of looking at what is the constitution of this nation. How do we move from being a physical entity and group as African peoples to now becoming a nation that is recognized as being a nation. And I say that because there's no legal definition of even being African. 
And I'm, what I mean, I don't mean legal in terms of what Europeans define as being legal. What I mean is there is no universal uh, understanding as to what it means to be an African. Okay? There are many, many different definitions that many of us probably like to, you know, keep talking about. But what does it mean to be an African? Yeah. Yeah. And we are not just people in a room because we often make that mistake. Oh, we just, we're just an alternative. It's just African people trying to ape and mimic the Europeans. So they've got Westminster. We have to do things like them. We have to be like them. We have to beat them at their own game. Yeah, we're the first people. We're the best. No, we don't beat them at their own game. Why? Because we know what they have produced. And many of us have learned from that, but we also know that it is not going to take us forward. And that's why we have to reclaim what is ours. And that's what we're trying to do. And one of the, and there's some clear steps and processes. I've only got a few minutes, but there's some clear steps and processes around how we move from our factual existence to a legal existence, which is where we are recognized globally in terms of international organizations, in terms of even how this British government sees us as being an African people. Because at present, they will label us BME and Afri you're on the census, the UK census, you're either black African, black Caribbean, or black other. So I don't know if you fill out those forms, but I don't because I'm not splitting myself in that way. And, and that's what it is that they are forcing us to do. And remember, it's not just a form. What they are doing is redefining our identity and redefining us out of existence. Because the forms used to say, about 12 years ago, Afro-Caribbean, even though we know it's African-Caribbean, now, you're either black African or black Caribbean. You can't be African Caribbean. And all the funding then accompanies that, although they're pulling all the funding away from Caribbean organizations and African organizations. And we fall into this trap because we allow the state to define us. And this is a form of violence. We talk about violence in our communities and we talk about gun crime and what our youth are doing and domestic violence, but this is what's called structural violence. Yeah. A bigger form of violence because it's that structural violence and what's called epistemic violence, which is the violence of knowledge and systems. So the mere fact that our identity doesn't even appear on that form is a form of violence. Why don't we recognize it as being violent? And we have the right to defend ourselves against violence. Why are we so cowardly? But anyhow, the stages in terms of this recognition, and I'm just showing you how easy it is. First stage is a subjective criteria. We have to have the will to exist as a separate, and distinct identity. Yeah. Separate and distinct identity. That means we have to have the will to be African. Yeah. And we have to self-identify as being African in terms of individuals as belonging to an African group, people, or nation. And the development of the solidarity then of individuals who self-define in this way coming together under a group banner, which is what we're seeking to do, the National African People's Parliament that is made up of many constituent groups and organizations and movements and individuals. And that is the first stage. The second stage is the awareness of us as African people of the importance of our interests our interests, not the interests of the British state, not the interests of our bosses at work, but our own interests, which is the protection and the preservation of our culture and our humanity. As well as restoring the potential of our culture to be able to answer the problems and provide solutions to the challenges that we are facing today. Yeah. So we are meant to have equality. But equality in law precludes 
the fact that we're not meant to be discriminated against in any way, shape or form. But is that the case? No. We're always crying about discrimination and racism and gender-based discrimination and so forth and religious oppression and all kinds of manner of isms and schisms. But there's a difference between having what they call formal equality, where we're told that we are equal to all other peoples in this nation, and there's something called substantive equality, which is really what it would take for us to actually have equity, for us to have everything restored to us that has been taken from us and continues to be taken from us. So that is the second stage. We have to move beyond thinking that we've got equality because a piece of paper, a so-called statute passed in the Houses of Parliament tells us that we are equal. Is that all you want? The final stage, sorry, the third stage of five, is the development of autonomous organizations and institutions. These are the stages of recognition of us as a nation, an African people who are now forming a nation that is global by linking into the various groupings of Africans around the planet. And that's why the, the third stage in terms of the autonomous institution building is the NAPP, the National African People's Parliament. The fourth stage is the development of forms of representation of our interests and the ex uh, internal acceptance of this form of representation. That's your acceptance of us and what we're trying to do. And that's not accepting by being outside the process, that's you being inside the process. That's the fourth stage around recognition. That's why I'm saying what we are doing is historic and so significant. Because a lot of the time we make history and we don't even realize we're making history. And because we haven't seen that big bright light at the end, we abort our mission before we've even got to where it is we're supposed to be going. Because it doesn't look like Westminster. It doesn't look like what we're used to. It doesn't look familiar. Now the fifth stage is external acceptance of a process like this, which is where we can now internationally have that recognition amongst our people internationally and other peoples and nations of the world. So we're already towards stages three and potentially stage four of a five-stage pro process. That's what it is. That's what we have to do. So it's no small feat what we are trying to do now, but as I said, we need more of you to come on board. Do you want to be part of this nation building process or not? Or are you going to keep trying to carve out a space for yourself within the British nation? Okay, that's the two choices that we have. Many of us are already part of the British nation by default, not by choice. What has it yielded us? And if we think we're doing okay, just let us not have a false sense of superiority. Let's look at our families. Our families in the Caribbean, our families in Africa, how are they doing? If they're all doing okay, then maybe we might be able to say we're doing okay. But because one of us is able to climb a ladder and reach a so-called glass ceiling before it cracks and shatters our illusions and our dreams. And if we think that's progress, but what about the group? You see, a system like this will always allow few to get through and have the rest of us chasing the few. And then we have the crab in a barrel syndrome because we feel, well, no, I can't make it easier for the rest to come through because it's gonna spoil my chances. And we've been hoodwinked. We've been trapped. We've been had. And we know better now. So if we know better, then we have to do better. But this nation, and sticking to the theme of nation building and birthing the nation, 
This is a nation which our ancestors dreamed of. They dreamed of that because from the time that we were kidnapped from the shores of Africa, our people formed community and nation, unifying our various ethnicities that we were, our indigenous African ethnicities and nation groupings. We did it in the Caribbean, in our maroon community, so-called, which is not just in Jamaica, by the way. We have them all over the Americas. I know in Suriname, Guyana, we have maroon communities, so-called. St. Vincent, too, we have Garifuna, we have peoples in Belize, all these places. All Grenada, all these places. This is our nation. And we are at a unique moment in history to be able to speak to our nation and reach out to our nation. Because all these different peoples are now reconnecting. There is this revival of this spirit of emancipation and freedom that our foreparents had. And that's what we need to connect to as well. And by doing that, we will inspire even those dead ones amongst us. Even those zombies. Because many of our people, they're waiting to see, you know. Because they're looking to see, can this really work? Because we've lost faith and confidence in self and each other. We can trust the Europeans. We rely on them every day to feed us, do for us, clothe us, educate our children, but insult us, but that is the sign of an unfree people. And I know that we love, I know as parents and as community parents, we love our children. We want the best for our children. But don't you think that we need to do better? Don't you think we need to leave them a different example? a different example and not be complicit. The reason why many of them are running away from us is because they don't see any power in what we're doing. Yeah. They'd rather go and, and join, you know, other communities and nations who they see engaged in a fight back and a resistance that they don't see amongst us. Because many of us are scared. We talk about Martin Luther King and all these other so-called civil rights leaders. But how many of us are prepared to engage in acts of civil disobedience like he did? Yeah, how many of us are, in, are prepared to do that? To break laws? To stand up for something? To sacrifice? To even go in prison if we have to? I'm not saying that that's what I'm advocating. But I'm saying when we are teaching our children history, tell them the truth about what our people have had to do. At every stage, we have won any concessions. Tell them the truth. Because they see our hypocrisy. They see a big gap between the theory of us being great African people and the mothers and fathers of human civilization and the reality. They see cowards. They see people who cannot stand up for themselves. They see people who can't feed them. They see people who can't give them work offend for them. That's what they see. Where's our honor? Where is our shame? Because this is about being African. Every people has a notion of shame and honor and their code as to what it means to be who they are. Where's ours? That's what we need to get back. That's the spirit we need to inculcate. And we need to do it collectively. We need to learn from the mistakes of the past because our protection is in our unity. We don't need any more dead heroes. We don't need any more assassinations. But what we do need is a community that can step up to the plate, that can defend its own, that can defend its children, that can defend its men and women. That's what we need, and that is our task today. The question is, are you up to it? Because if you're not up to it, then this parliament is not for you. You're very welcome, but if you're not up to that task and that responsibility, this is not for you. This nation that has to be born is a nation that our ancestors dreamed of. 
They saw this day and they saw this point where we would have to be at a crossroads and there's a fork in the road and we have to choose. And they saw the choices that we would make. And I can tell you the end. The end is a good ending, but we have to choose that ending. We still have to walk into our history. History is not predetermined like that. We have to make it. History is not just about calling the names and saying this is what they did 30 and 50 and 100 years ago and building pyramids. We have to be the makers of history today. We have to become the shapers and the masters of our own destiny. And this nation, this nation, they have been trying to abort this nation. That's why we're talking about a rebirth. Because this nation wants to be born. And we are the parents and the grandparents. And some of those who are not even in this room but have moved on to another realm, they are urging us on as the mother give birth to this nation. Don't allow them to take this child. Now, this isn't any condemnation of any sister that has had to make particular choices around not bringing a particular child. But this is a child that must live. It must live. Now, the nation that we were given in terms of the neo-colonial states in Africa and the Bantu stands in the Caribbean and everywhere else that we think is ours, that wasn't our child. It was a child of imperialism. And because we birthed it as well, we have this love-hate relationship with it. We feel it's ours and we feel we have to hold on to it. And it's like a plastic toy that serves no real function. And even though it's killing us, we still have this emotional connection to it because it's about family. You know, many of our families built it and we've got that tie, but we have to birth this new child because we are clearer in our vision now. We know that it's not aping Europe. We know that we have a rich heritage an ancestry to draw on. And we must not allow anybody, whether it's internal or external to our community, to abort this child. And we, as men and women, have to find a way to come together to build strong family and community a nation for the sake of this child. And this child that is going to be born, which is the nation that the National African People's Parliament is seeking to be a key a sister in. Because really we should be about natural birth, but you know what? This has to be an assisted birth. We need to assist the birth of this child. Why? Because it's been too long. And if we don't assist the birth, we are in danger of having a stillborn. And once again, another generation lost. Another generation left to start at the same beginnings that our ancestors, you know, 100, 150 years ago were starting at. So it's about the role that all of us in this room and everyone outside of this room who's not here, but intuitively, spiritually, emotionally, cognitively, intellectually, in every kind of way, knows and can hear the truth of what is being said, knows that there's something missing from what we've been taught is our lot in this world knows that there has to be another way and is courageous enough to try and find it. It's for all of us to be stewards, to be midwives of the expectant. And I'm not going to say expectant mother because we know even though the mother carries the child, the father, the whole family and the community are expectant. We all have to become expectant 
and pregnant with this possibility of what this nation will become. That's the main message of the theme, the rebirth of the African nation, the rebirth of the nation. It's not the rebirth of Britain or Black Britain. That's it. At the uh, commemorations for the 30th anniversary of the New Cross massacre, there was an African journalist who was writing in the BBC who was doing a report on the National Black People's Day of Action as it took place in 1981. And he basically said that that was a defining moment in the history of and shaping of a black Britain. 32 years later, we have to move on from the notion of a black Britain. What's black? Black Britain. And we have to now see ourselves as part of Africa, as African people. It's not just about wearing the name and thinking that, well, we can be African and, and forge our power base within the, within the confines of the UK. We are not a nation within a nation because the nation that we need to birth cannot coexist with a nation that is seeking to kill and suck the very lifeblood from our veins. The two things cannot inhabit the same space. So our nation, even though we're here, we have to link to where our power is. And as midwives, we have to ensure that we stamp out all those attempts to stop the growth of this nation. We have to ensure that we give birth to the nation, the parliament, but also to the new ways of doing things that is a corrective on the old ways. We know the mistakes that we've made, even within this process the last two years. This also, as midwives, we have to ensure that we do not be party to and complicit in the attempts to abort this birth. Killing this birth, killing this child before it's even had a chance to grow. And we also have to make sure that this doesn't become another stillbirth. Where we spend enormous energy giving birth to something that's already dead. But this is going to require you. We really need you. We need you. You need us. We need each other. So the main things that we want you to do is please sign up now. I think we've done a lot of talking. Please get on board. There's only so much we can do in a forum like this. The work happens in between the forums like this. The work happens every day. I work every day for the parliament. For no money, but you know what my payment is? Is knowing that I am part of a generation of March that began way before I was born and will continue probably even long after I leave this planet. And knowing that I play my role, but it's not about me. It's about you and all of us together. So, brothers and sisters, that is my humble contribution today in terms of our theme, Rebirth of the Nation. Remember, the parliament is not a means to an, e an end in itself, sorry. It is a means to an end because we need change. If we are going to preserve our future, if we are going to secure the future of our children, even in this room, not alone those ones who have not yet come, but they're, lo they're, they're, they're in a realm where they're watching. Do I want to be part of this nation? 
Do I really want to be born African? Do I really want this responsibility? So being African is not only a right, but it is a responsibility and a duty. It's not about the name. It's not about how we look. It's about how we live our lives. And every day, we have to question, are we building up someone else's house that is destroying our house? Because if we want to be content with a little room in the council flat they're giving us, when we have a whole continent, then that's up to you. But I wasn't good at maths at school, but that doesn't add up to me. It doesn't add up to me. I don't know about the rest of you. And we're fighting each other over these little turf wars, a little piece of land, concrete jungles. That's why we have to have a global perspective and understanding of our situation. Because guess what? Every situation we're facing here today, every issue of brutality and dis injustice and discrimination, guess what? Wherever our people are on the planet, guess what? We're experiencing the same thing. So wouldn't it make sense, again, I'm not a mathematician, but wouldn't it just add up if we link with them? Yeah. So that's your choice. Thank you. Sister Ekua Stanford Zose. Sister Ekua Stanford Zose. Healer.